So, in this video we're going to be focusing on psychology and, in particular, the behaviourist approach. The behaviourist approach emerged at the start of the 20th century and it became the dominant approach in psychology for about half of that century. The early behaviourists, such as John B. Watson, rejected uh, introspection because it involved too many processes that were too hard to measure, such as internal mind processes. Um, such as thinking, reasoning, etc. As a result of this, behaviourists rely more on objectivity and actually observing the behaviour, so they did this using lab experiments. Assumption 1. Behaviour is mainly concerned with stuff that can be observed, so they the main way they do this is through lab experiments, so they're not interested in mind processes such as um, thinking, as I just said, they're more interested in behaviour that can be observed. This is because observable behaviour can be actually measured scientifically. Assumption 2. Psychology is a science, so it must be measured in highly controlled conditions, so you can tell um, cause and effect between the IV and the DV. So, assumption 3 is that we are born tabula rasa, which was a phrase first coined by John Locke. Um, so this means that we are all born a blank slate. So if you think about the nature-nurture debate, the behaviorism debate, the, the behaviorist approach would firmly be nurture. We learn from the environment that's around us. We pick up behaviors from other people. This is more explained in the social learning theory, but also in behaviorism. Assumption, um, Four. There is little difference between the behaviour of humans and the behaviour of animals. So, in behaviourism, it's an assumption that we can use animal studies to actually test behaviours and relate it to humans also. A O three point would be the problems of anthropomorphism, which is the idea that humans are different to animals, so um, any results found from those studies can't actually be related to humans. Assumption 5. Assumption 5 is that all behaviour can be reduced to a stimulus response action. So even if it's a complex thing, it can still be reduced to the stimulus response um, mechanism. Yes. Assumption 6. I've already outlined this, but if we think about it, this is on the nurture side of the debate, as the sixth assumption is that we pick up behaviour from the environment, so uh, behaviour is learnt. If you've heard about behaviourism but don't actually know much about it, you've probably heard about two main key principles, which are classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Classical conditioning, this is learning through association. So, if I smell food, my mouth's going to start watering because I love food. Pavlov was studying classical conditioning and he used dogs which as you remember is an assumption of the behaviourist approach because we can use animal studies to learn about human behaviour. So Mr Ivan Pavlov, which is quite a cool name, he harnessed a dog to a bench and put a tube coming out of his mouth into a jar. Pavlov noticed that when his assistants came into the room with food the dogs salivated upon hearing the sound of the door. Pavlov noticed that the dogs had made an association association with the sound of the door and food and receiving food. So they had made this association. They had been classically conditioned. Pavlov was able to show how a neutral stimulus could lead to a conditioned response. Now we will move on to operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is learning by consequence. So this comes in three forms, which are positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and punishment. In positive reinforcement, a child, for example, receives a reward for completing a certain behaviour. So, for example, uh, doing your homework on time will result in you getting a sticker or going early to lunch. So positive reinforcement is reinforcing that behaviour through praise and this makes a behaviour continue. Negative reinforcement, you do a behaviour so that 
you avoid a bad consequence. For example, you complete your homework on time so that the teacher doesn't shout. This also makes the behaviour repeat so that you avoid these bad consequences. Punishment, however, is when you actually get punished, believe it or not. For example, not completing your homework results in you getting shouted at by the teacher. You're more likely to give in your homework on time to avoid that punishment. A key study on this was done by B.F. Skinner who was another main behaviourist and he's most famous for Skinner's box. He tested on pigeons and rats which again you can relate back to how animals can be used to test to test the behaviour of humans. In the box was a rat and also in the box was a lever. When the rat pressed the lever food came out onto a tray so soon the rat learned that pressing the lever would result in a reward food. The rat continued to show this behaviour because he was positively, re positively reinforced. Skinner also showed negative reinforcement in the study because he put an electric grid on the floor. Every time the rat would move around he would get shocked by this electric current. But he learned that when he knocked the lever the currents would actually stop which negatively reinforced his actions and behaviours because he wanted to avoid being shocked by the current. Now we'll look at the evaluation points of the behaviourist approach. Our first evaluation point is the emergence of psychology as a science. This approach is able to bring the language of the natural sciences into psychology and really emphasise the focus on, on observable behaviour and lab experiments. And of course as we know lab experiments are highly controlled so this help to establish cause and effect between the IV and the DV. By emphasising the importance of scientific processes such as, uh, such as objectivity and replicatability, it really was influential in the development of psychology as a science and increasing the credibility and the status of psychology. Our second evaluation point is it has real life applications. So the behaviourist approach can actually be generalised to the real world. Due to our understanding of phobias, um, the behaviourist approach has helped us to develop a treatment called systematic desensitisation, which includes unlearning the behaviour. It has actually helped to build an effective treatment. However, a very notable criticism of the behaviourist approach is that it is extremely reductionist. It looks at animals as just machine-like responders to the environment with little free will or no free will and they're simply just products of the environment. Therefore we could uh, criticise the behaviourist approach and say that it completely undermines any other factor that can affect our behaviour. Uh, other approaches such as the social learning theory and the cognitive approach have actually shown the importance of considering mental processes in making decisions. These processes suggest that people actually play more of a role in their behaviour rather than the environment. So this suggests that this approach may actually be more suitable for testing behaviour on animals than on humans. Thank you for watching this video, it's the end now. Um, as normal, or as usual, you can leave any comments in the description and requests and all that shit. Thumbs up, like, wait, is that the same thing? Um, subscribe and stay cool.